Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the True Crime Podcast of the Roundtable. Thank you all so much for joining us. It's great to have you here this evening. So my name is Adam, host of the UK True Crime Podcast. Let's introduce my co-host. Firstly, Mike, you've been in the wars this week. What's been going on? Oh, uh, <laughs> I've been an idiot. I injured my back, so I put a hot water bottle in it because I was, I was, my back was sore. The water bottle split. I didn't realise, and I, I've got uh, second degree burns on my back. Ooh, <laughs> nice. So, so I went to the hospital, and they a very nice uh, nurse burst them. She, okay. you, you could you could feel her doing that. She had to kind of twist them off, and she was having such a lovely time. <laughs> well, so for those of you who are eating dinner, I hope you're enjoying your food. <laughs> shall shall I get them out? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's move on. Paul, how's things in Wrexham? Things in Wrexham are very wet at the moment. It has just been biblical rain all weekend. So I'm, so I'm expecting to see the ark floating past later on. It is just crazy. Apart from that, everything is ticky boo. Hey, great stuff. And we've got two fantastic guests tonight. Um, known to all of you here, I'm sure. We've got Bob and Ali, the hosts of Twisted Britain. Hey, guys. How you doing? You all right? Hey, both. Hi, everybody. We're good. This is the most technical we've ever been at any point in our lives together. <laughs> it is. It took me half an hour to log in. But you've got more of this to come because in the old days, you boys used to go to the boozer in Sterling, have a chat, and that was it, wasn't it? So what's been going on? I've heard you've moved, Ali. I am now in Bournemouth. I am engaged. Wow. That's incredible. a mad engagement ring. I'm just like everybody to take a fucking ring, moment three for this. diamonds. That's... No carrots. <laughs> so, so how's the show going now then? What, what, what's happening? We've done really well. Still, we're I'm um, coming up to uh, Scotland as much as possible uh, to record with Bob. We're trying at least once a month and doing three or four records if possible. We did. Uh, we did a couple of records. What was it now? Two weeks ago, Ali. You might be out coming up in the next week or two. But uh, our issue is like we'd love to do all of our recordings live because actually we find it better in person, much for the conversational aspect of that. The problem is, by the time Ali and I have spent two and a half hours in the pub recording a couple of episodes, the third episode is just nonsense. Yeah, <laughs> it's just hammered by the end of it. <laughs> yeah, but I've also started doing uh, tiny twisteds and putting them out on uh, Facebook as videos. They've been they've been really good, actually. Uh, I've really enjoyed them because I don't have to do any work mainly. Um, they have a bit. Of, they have a bit of. Um, the same kind of feel as your videos that you do, Adam, when you're out and about. So, uh, but Ali does them in the pub because it's on brand, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and because I love a pint. Yeah. <laughs> Stop doing it in spoonses, though. I'm sad at you. Yeah. Start get in one spoon. Mm. Oh, spoons, okay. So, let me tell you. Let me tell the format this evening. So, <laughs> Ali's going to talk to us about a subject for ten minutes or so, and Bob's going to talk to us about something. Paul, Mike. I mentioned a few things. Then we'll finish by about in about fifty minutes. So, Ali, over to you. Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, a couple of things, which I think are um, systemic of the growth in true crime uh, recently. The growth in our industry has been staggering. I think uh, across the board over the past couple of years, uh, true crime podcasts alone from I think it was 2020 to 2022, saw like a 66% increase in listeners to over 22 million, I think it is now. Uh, and televised documentaries, I think, show very similar growth. So as more and more new podcasts appear, and as TV channels scramble, essentially, to create enough content to keep up with demand, um, I was interested to know if you guys thought, as I do, uh, that we're seeing a worrying increase in the more sensationalist documentaries and podcast content and a decrease uh, in the quality and the extent of research in a lot of them. Fucking hell, Ali. Uh, I'll, I'll caveat that with you because we had a brief chat earlier, like I say brief couple of minutes really on the phone. And... I think our takeaways from just our wee chat was like, 
more content's good if it's done well. Now, I know yeah. you, you guys think probably think along the same lines that if, you know, one fact wrong in a show devalues it entirely, I think it's, it's fair to say. I think my issue with it is when it's presented as like perfection and it's absolute dog shit. I think, you know, the, the trade-off of production value is where I really struggle. Mm. Yeah. No, I agree. I think, I think with, a, especially with podcasts as well, there's, I think this is something that we've all noticed, especially uh, during lockdown, that a lot of people jumped on the, the true crime bandwagon because they, because they wanted to be famous and they, you know, that was their focus. They wanted to make money and they, a lot weren't really into true crime. So you're right. There's been a real dearth of kind of, um, quality research a lot of people just yeah, want to yeah. use wikipedia and and unfortunately you can see that with tv shows where they get they make a lot of mistakes yeah and um i was talking to a producer recently about tv shows true crime tv shows and they tend not to be written by do you know, like if you get a history show it'll be written by professor such and such who's an expert yeah. on royalty or stuff like that true crime doesn't have that it tends to be written by the company who makes it who go, yeah, oh well that's popular. Oh great, we've got a commission. Well we'll write it, which is why they make mistakes. So yeah, there's a lot there's no of no regulation. No. And I I think I think people seem to think that if you put it out on telly that a team of people sit down and they go, right, okay, let's go through all your research and double check that it's right. But it's not because yeah. because they've got a schedule to reach to, they've just got to get it out. They've got to get it done. They yeah. want to make the money and they want to fuck off. Yeah, uh, and I think you mentioned briefly there the fame game as well. Uh, and I think that's that's even worse uh, in a lot of ways. I remember the start of last year, the Nicola Bewley case, mm. where she fell in the river uh, and her family were inundated with people um, bothering them. And they weren't true crime podcasters. They were um, TikTokers and conspiracy theorists and properties in the town were broken into by people who were pretending to be investigative journalists, but they were just social media influencers looking for clicks. I think, I wonder if we're going to get to the point where the police will turn up at a scene and the scene will be ruined by podcasters, TikTokers, trying to get their footage. I think yeah, we're not too far away from that. Because that, that must be a nightmare for you, like you, Bob, being a... a like, given that you're a proper journalist, there's there must be a real kind of counterbalance of you and your ethics and what you're trained to do, and that people who will just bulldoze into an area to film something because they want to get famous. Absolutely, and I mean, you know, journalism, and we're no matter what you th think about mainstream media and journalism in the UK, we're very lucky to have a very well regulated, decent press. Um, you can disagree with me as much as you want, but I, I genuinely believe that. And there isn't a, a, a journalistic ethic that goes with that, as you say. So we, we would never in, immediately respond to something because you have to have that fact right, because once it's out there, as we all know, once it's out there, it's out there. Um, the, the podcasting element of that, and, and I'll use podcasting because, to be honest, I'm just going to lump kind of YouTube podcasting, all that kind of content creation into, into, into one umbrella term. Um, as you say, because there's no regulation, there's no knockback. And, you know, those that will name remain unnamed, I've done it before, but I'll not do it again on your show, um, that either take other people's research or verbatim, whether it's right or wrong, and just spew it out there, is enough another uh, entity to this as well. The problem being, I think, is that there are people out there who do a very, very good job who aren't trained journalists who aren't ex-police force so the problem there falls is that if you regulate it too much you make it difficult for people who are good at what they do but not experts at what they do if that makes if you see what i mean yeah no that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. yeah it does paul what, what, what do you think about this well I, I pretty much agree with all of the points that have been raised so far i'll go back to what mike said about um I think really that broadcasting, say, say I can think of a certain particular channel, I won't name it, but most of the content is featured on true crime and 
it's a lot of it is absolute dog shit to quote Rob as well. I think <laughs> I, th- I think quite bizarrely and sadly, as technology and time and the availability of things like drones and everything has gone on, and something could be wonderful, it's gone too much repetitive and vague. Compare and contrast, say, a documentary that comes on a certain channel now and Crime Watch UK that's available on YouTube. And you think, remember Crime Watch, it's concise, it's to the point, memorable, because it's it's all factually correct. Nothing's repeated in it. We you should get the same drone shot. After every advert break, you'll get the same recap of what's happened. Yeah. You know, they make an hour program into something about 15 minutes worth of content, really. And I find that quite bizarre. I, I, I think makers get lazy because they jump on this true crime bandwagon and want to get something out there. I think, oh, my God, everybody's going to watch it because they'll be talking about it and TikToking about it and all this bollocks. And and no, it's not. It's sensationalism. A lot of it is, yes. Yeah, we we used to see a lot of that on on Adam's forum where every so often you'd get someone jump in and they'd go, hi, I'm from a production company. We're doing a documentary about Dennis Nielsen. Does anyone know anything about Dennis? And you go, hang on, you're the researcher. You you should be way ahead of this instead of going to a, a forum and asking random people for their thoughts. It's just, but as we know, with a lot of these true crime shows, the researchers will... You don't have true crime researchers. What you have is researchers. So they might work on a history show. They might work on a sports show. They might work on a cooking show. And they'll jump between them. So there's no, there's no experts out there except very occasionally when you get a, a curated true crime series. I was just about to say that. There are exceptions to this massively. Mm. There is stuff that is incredibly well made and well mm. documented. You take the the Emma Caldwell case that's just closed in in, in Scotland. You know, nineteen years without somebody um, <clears throat> being found guilty for it. The um, the documentary kind of interview that um, Sam Poling, who's a BBC investigative journalist, did actually interviewing uh, Ian Packer is incredible. Like it's one of the best pieces of, of of true crime journalism that's happened in the last few while. In my opinion, I'm very lucky to know Sam, but at the same time, I think what she did was incredible. And you tie that in then again with the the I'm not Nicholas, the Nicholas Rossi podcast that came out last year. Yeah, uh, it just so well done. It actually puts it's, they will get the numbers obviously because they're on big platforms and they're made by big uh, production houses and stuff like that. But actually, the effort that's gone into making these either TV series or podcasts puts even those of us around this round table to shame because mm. it's an insane amount of work to create eight episodes on one case, uh, for instance. And when done well, it's beautiful. It really is. But when it's done badly, it's absolute nonsense. And and as some, and somebody should have said in the chat, how do you regulate that? You, you can't. It's, it's, it literally costs nothing to start a podcast. We've all got mm. this. You know, we've all got one of these and a set of headphones. I convinced Mike to buy some AirPods recently. Changed his life, oh, apparently. Oh, um, my God, they're amazing. <laughs> but that's literally all you need to create a podcast. Then you go on somewhere like Spreaker or Acast or whoever it happens to be. I won't, you know, not siding with anyone, but do download the Spreaker app. If you're going to use Twisted Button, it's much better. Um, uh, I, I also think the quality is going to go down now as well, now that people are starting to use AI to do their research. Uh, I I'm not sure. Yeah, so content quality, I would agree with. Sound production quality oh, yeah. can only go up, yeah. and that's that's massively. And I'm I'm sure uh, Bethan from Seeing Red will not mind me quoting her saying that she feels like they recorded their first episodes on a potato. It's one of my favourite things she's ever said. Um, the but research, the research, yeah, yeah. I was I think Mike and I and Ali had the pleasure of meeting up in London for a couple of pints this week. I'm sure it was a telling- couple. <laughs> and, then a, and then a couple more. Uh, I wrote an episode of Twisted Britain using uh, ChatGPT. And I say I wrote it. I didn't tell Ali I was doing this. So I just basically wrote, I asked it the question, can you write an episode of Twisted Britain? And other than the fact that um, it wrote the intro correctly, got our, our Facebook and everything correct in the intro, 
called us Mary and Sally or something like that. So, you know, just got a weekend name. Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> got there before you. Um, and he gave me the case of the disappearance of um, Agatha Christie, which actually is very Twisted Britain. Like it's, it's right on brand for what we talk about. Yeah, that's up there but for you guys, isn't it? It was like 1,200 words. And it's actually, you know what, what it was? It was a synopsis of the case, giving hmm. a couple of uh, facts in amongst the way. So what I did was I took that and I read that verbatim, but I also did my own research and wrote my, my normal notes that I did and did the right episode. But actually, that was, when was that, Ali? Was that, was that the beginning of last year? Yeah, Must have been about that. But it was so close to being good. It wasn't good, but it was close to being good that it's not going to take much time. I mean, me just asking it that question has made AI better. You know, that, that that's the ridiculous fact of it. But people, you know, there's, it, it, it would be so easy to do a you know, $9.99 a month better platform than GG, yeah, GDP or whatever mm -hmm. and get a script every week and just sit here and read it. That, well, that's not, that is probably the future. Well, Bob, um, th th let's name names. I, I'm quite happy to name names. So the plagiarism one's a crime junkie. So uh, <laughs> number one in the US, all the rest of it. And if you do a search on crime junkie plagiarism, you'll see the scandal. <laughs> <laughs> and they refuse to take it all down. So AI might be a step forward for them. But hey, they're making yeah. a million pounds. But look, let's not go there. Let's should we move on, Bob? Let's move on to what, what were you going to bring to the table today? Just a beer, usually. But um no, I actually wanted to talk a bit about the um the Ian the, the Emma Caldwell murder case that's just been uh, happening in, in the UK. It was 19 years to bring uh, Ian Packer to justice. I don't want to talk about him because why should anybody ever fucking talk about him? I, anyway, there will obviously be a podcast about it somewhere down the line, but it's not for us to do. Um, he was handed the second longest sentence in Scottish courts. Um, I think Adam could probably name the longest sentence. He's written a book about the man. Um, so uh, Packer got 36 years, uh, which is because there's no whole life term in Scotland. So when we're doing our research for, for um, cases, we always have to be very, uh, we have to remember whether we're talking about Scotland, England, Wales, Northern Ireland, because obviously there's different justice systems and the Scottish justice system is uh, inherently more different, I would say, than, than, than the other ones. But I think probably what I'm asking is, at what point do we think the prison system should be dealt with and should we have a whole life term we're no, none of us around here believe that capital punishment should be a thing. <clears throat> um, but And then there's the third verdict in, in Scotland, that's the not proven uh, thing, which they're in the, the theory of talking about removing. But to be fair, they've been talking about that for years and years and years. I just kind of wanted to talk a bit about, because um, oh, that's always the end of our podcast, isn't it? The end of the podcast yeah. is they go to jail and something happens, or we don't know who did it. You know, that that... that the culmination of pretty much everybody around this table's cases are, and then the court hands out whatever sentence. And it just, do you feel like when you get to the end of the research for the cases, you're kind of doing it, you, you, you tend to feel more pissed off at what's handed out more often than not? It's probably the easiest way of putting that. Uh, that's an interesting question. Mike, what do you think? Um... <laughs> Sorry, I was. I, was well, I, I waffled a lot there as well. Sorry. Apologies. No, I'm pouring you. I was halfway through reading a text at the same time mm -hmm. from a family member. So someone else talk, and then I'll I'll catch up. Professional podcaster. Professional, right, yeah. right, right to the heart. Right. Also, it's quite warm in here. I've got I've got the fire on. Well, Ali, what, what do you think? Um, I would I would agree with Bob. Um. And I'll also point out, though, that although Scotland don't have a statutory life sentence, an entire life sentence, when someone's uh, sentenced to life with 37 years, they will serve a minimum of 37 years. That was the 36-year sentence Bob's talking about. That is 36 years before he'll even be considered for parole. Um, so it's, it is a very severe sentence. Mm. Um, but... Uh, I I always come at it from a historian's point of view. Um, I I tell the story, and I accept um, the judgment of the justice system at the time. Um, I never agree with punishment, for example, 
But unless it's a miscarriage of justice, that person got the sentence appropriate to the time period. Mm. You, we've talked about this on an episode recently. I can't remember if that episode's actually gone out, but that was literally your words were, I don't, and I'm pretty sure, in fact, no, I think it's the episode that just went out, the June and Devaney case that we just cut, that I covered recently. It's one of the yeah. only times I've ever said, if you want to skip forward a bit to not hear what happened to June, skip forward a minute and a half now. A four-year-old girl who was taken from a hospital and horrible things happened to her. And it was a man just, who, fuck knows why he did it. I still don't know why he did it. But he was he was sentenced to to execution. And it was your words were literally like, this is the only time I've gone, yeah, fine, that's all right. And it was ex it was the most he could have been given in the time period. So it was the right. Yeah. But now, you know, obviously, you move on. Exactly. But, but the, right. there are exceptions to that as well. I was at a, a fascinating talk very recently by Professor Rose Wallace, um, a historian in Dorchester, mm. on the Elizabeth Martha Brown case. Um, she murdered her husband in 1850-something. I can't remember the specific date. Um, but she was a serial domestic abuse victim. Um, and he was an adulterous domestic abuser. Um, but her case was handled very poorly and very poorly for very political reasons. Um, she was given the death sentence. Um, it was carried out. Um, but it is considered one of the biggest miscarriages of justice. And it was actually one of the cases that uh, led to the abolishment of capital punishment. All right. Oh, super interesting. Paul, have you got a view on this, Paul? I have, yeah. So um, I could be here all night talking about life sentences and everything like that. Does it, it, does it just, does what they get justify the crime that they've done? And I'm, not an advocate for cap capital punishment whatsoever. One mistake is too many, and we all know the examples in history of this. Now, for people like, say, the Moors murderers, or Sutcliffe when he was alive, that monster, I can't remember his name now, who murdered that family of three last year, who's just been given a whole lifetime, Damien something his name is right now, now, that's the maximum sentence you can get whole, whole life, right? But is it in, in prison, say, so he'll be segregated from the rest of the prisoners, right? He, he just has kind of the time of the time of his life, really. You know, he would get more than like, someone here on the streets and everything like that. And I firmly believe myself, if they're doing life for something like that, they should be told after they've been sentenced. At one point during your sentence, it might be tomorrow, it might be six or seven years down the line, but one day that gate separating you from the other prisoners will be left open and you will be beaten to within an inch of your life. We will save your life, we will heal you back, and then that will start again. And they should always have that morbid fear. Is it going to happen tomorrow? Is it going to happen ne in the next half an hour? You should live with that every waking moment of the day. That's punishment, I believe. Interesting. Mike, are you back with us? Is the family is everything okay in the family? Just checking. Well, they've just been sentenced on? to thirty-eight years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird because I've been watching a lot of court TV where they're sentencing people uh, on uh, via their webcams, and it's this is exactly like that. I kind of feel like Adam is the judge, and he's going to go for urinating in the street and having sex with a sheep. I charge you to twenty pounds. Hopefully, just twenty pounds. Not. Not a month in prison. Twenty pounds would be fine. Thank you. I've got that somewhere. I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you bring you, you bring that up actually because when Ali and I spoke earlier, that you, Ali had a couple of things that he was possibly going to talk about. The other one was um, based off the kind of question that Ali asked about impartiality within and clean scenes and too much information of, of crime scenes and things like that. Can you get such a thing as an impartial juror now? Because it's literally because of a twenty-four hour rolling news cycle and Twitter and or sorry, XX is gonna give it to you. Um Facebook, you know, everything's there instantly. So where we talk about, you know, the eighteen seventies and they moved the case from London to High Wycombe or whatever you know it happens to be, so that they can move it out of the town where the, the, the perpetrator committed their crimes. And that was enough to remove 
uh, you know, create impartiality. Sorry, yeah. Um, you just don't. You just don't have that anymore. No, you don't. I think it's ridiculous nowadays. If I was on the jury, I promise you, every night I'd be home. I'd be on social media. I'd be looking at the person responsible or accused, rather, and everyone else. I'd look at the other jury members, and I'd be trying to assess yeah. who might find them guilty. Wouldn't you? In reality, yeah, of course, hundred percent. I would. When I was foreman of the jury, I had to bring it up to one of the jurors because hmm? even, even though it had been mentioned to her, she was she was actually in the jury room on her phone. And I was like, I was like, I hate to be a, a bit of a bell end, but you're not really allowed to have your phone <laughs> in. She was like, she was because it was a an assault charge. And the other guy had already been tried, but we weren't allowed to know the outcome. And he he was actually found guilty. Um, she was like, I just want to know what happened to him. And it's like, you're not allowed to do that. She was like, I need to know. And I was like, no, you need to base the case on the evidence we've been given right here. But it's weird, isn't it? I think it's only going to get worse. They, they're going to oh. have to they're going to have to put people into secure isolation for the duration that they're in the, they're in the jury room. So it, it's got give them some form of training in making impartial decisions. Because these people, these, our jurors, literally come off the streets. It's just it's yeah. literally members of the public. Yeah. Well, there's an argument at the moment going on in the Scottish court systems about um, mm -hmm. uh, judge-led trials, completely judge-led trials, removing juries from sex crimes and 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 uh, you know a certain category of crimes. I'm sure it is just sexual sexual violence and sexual crimes. Um, I don't know enough about it to, to go into the details, but it's to be tried as if tried, haha. Um, so that it, you remove that inherent, I hate you because it's a sex crime, and okay. leave a professional to make that judgment. Well, you say that, Bob, but are they professional? So I've known about three judges in my life, and I wish I hadn't, okay? And they're so far removed from my life, they haven't got a clue what's going on. If I asked them what pegging was, they wouldn't know what it was. They couldn't even ask Prince What's William. That? they got no idea what, what pegging is. <laughs> they're, not, they're not living on the same planet as us. That's my concern. What, what is pegging, Adam? Um, this so is like next... the wrong time to... Poppy has just invaded, and, and this is what we're talking about. <laughs> Hello, Poppy. Um, Hi, Poppy. So, George Poppy, what's, what's your opinion on the death penalty? Is it good or bad? <laughs> <God>. <laughs> I wanted to know what she thinks about the death penalty. Oh, no, you don't. She's an absolute terrorist. You don't want to know. She's an advocate. I bet she's like off with her head straight away. <laughs> you bring back capital punishment like that. Yeah. She's, pro she's probably got like a noose outside ready to string people up. <laughs> don't, 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 jump in on the comments. Jump in on the comments that I can see here. Two good points I've just seen. That it's one from Catherine who says there's a good argument for professional juries. Mm -hmm. And underneath. Sarah asks, That's should not bad not idea, actually. Yeah, no, it's done in different countries. Think, point, uh, Scandinavia employ jurors for a full year and they'll give them two months training before they'll see a trial and they will pay them for that full year. Where's I'd do that? it. I'd love it, wouldn't you? I'll be there, would you? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I. I've never been called as a juror, and I'd I'd love to, but my issue is I'm a podcast researcher, so like <laughs> I'm I'm instantly starting taking notes. Yeah, but, but Bob, ask ask yourself why that is. You haven't been called. There is a reason, obviously, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. The I mean, way I've he, he, here's another way bouncing off that idea as well. Given the fact that one of the most popular university degrees is is law, and we have more lawyers in the world than we actually need. When, when all these people are going to university and learning to do law, why don't we make them jurors? Why isn't that part of the three-year university course in, in that every couple of weeks they just do jury service? They learn and they're professionals, and you don't have to train them. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It was such know, a good point that Ali fucked off. I know. I didn't know we were going to come on here and change the world, and Ali just blacked out and died. Yeah. Ali just exploded. <laughs> and Mike, on, on a similar point... If all the law students become jurors, what do all the criminology students do? Well, they, they go back to being unemployed. <laughs> all fat ex-detectives <laughs> with a book to sell. And, and a TV show. <laughs> a uh, shit TV show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm out. I've still got one more crime call to do. Give, give us a break. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy <laughs> it. Bob, Bob when, when's crime con... Um, Scotland in April, is it? April, yeah, yeah. Don't advertise it. I'm not going to. No, we'll be there though. <laughs> I'll advertise us. Uh, 
but no, Ali and I will be there in Glasgow and we look forward to seeing anybody who's coming along. Ali's already on his way there. That's why he's fucked off. He <laughs> started walking. <laughs> <laughs> to go to the bar. Right to pay for it, isn't it? That's what he's trying to do. Goodness gracious. Um, he started a crowdfunder. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's move on, shall we? Um, Paul, you were going to bring something to the table. Yeah, so recently, uh, topically in the news, I happened to catch a, an account the other day that Reference the infamous Mackay kidnapping. I'm sure you all know the story that I'm going on about the when the two brothers tried to kidnap the then wife of Rupert Murdoch, who's just got engaged again, apparently, at the age of 600 or whatever it is. <laughs> I think we know someone else who's that age as well. <laughs> <laughs> I we do, yeah. A yeah, walnut head. Yes, we do. Right, but, so Mackay, sure. He's got more engagements. Your average serial killer in prison, hasn't he? <laughs> he's got rings through him. He's that old. Right? <laughs> and, uh, so the Mackay case pops up on the news the other day. It's an infamous case. I'm sure you all know the case that I'm going on about, don't you? Two brothers kidnapped who they thought was the wife of then wife of Rupert Murdoch, grabbed the deputy chairman's wife, Muriel Mackay, the body was never found. They were captured soon after, and it's an infamous case. Now, one of the brothers is dead. The other one was released long ago and deported back to Trinidad. And he is now working with the Mackay family to try and find her body. And I was on the kind of belief that she was fed to pigs. And if that was the case, do you think there is any chance of them actually finding anything or is it just is it mentioned on the news because of its infamy and it's a pointless exercise what do you think Ooh. what do you think i i think myself personally after 55 years i don't think they'll find anything and it's Ooh. not a ma- it's around a farm it's not a massive site in the scale of say saddleworth moor where keith bennett is buried it's not a massive scale to look. I do not think they will find anything. I wondered what your thoughts were. It's, especially if it's like a moor, like uh, as I said with the Moors murderers, when you put a body in kind of like peat and things like that, it degrades really fast. So the likelihood of finding anything or, or, or anything that's serviceable as a piece of evidence, after this amount of time, it's just not going to be credible, is it? And it's interesting. We... Um spoke recently Ali and I about a case that I can't remember which one it was but basically it was a a cold case from the 1920s and um, basically we came to the conclusion that at some point barring a massive massive change in technology a cold case has to become a frozen case for lack of a better word Hmm. at some point they become unsolvable and, and you know, and each case will have a different tipping point. So yeah, fifty-five years you're talking about, Paul. That might be enough for it to be well. There's, we'll never get anything. But you know, there are other cases that it could be. It's only going to take five or six years. You know, a, a body at sea or something like that. I don't know. I'm just picking things out of the air now. Um, but the, that difference between cold case and revisiting and due giving it due diligence and due purpose, like them going back to look at the farm, is the right thing to do. In the back of their heads, there's no way they think they're going to find anything. But the, the the interest to me is at what point do you go? A cold case is now unsolvable. Like this is the point where we go. We can't do it anymore. Well, it brings me on to something else. Sorry to interrupt you, mate. It brings me on to something else that I wanted to raise as well, which is the fact that I believe the team looking for Madeline McCann have just been awarded another. Hundred thousand pounds to continue their investigation. Thank God for that. Because, <laughs> as, as we all know, that only one child has ever gone missing ever. My point exactly, Mike. My point exactly. <laughs> when are the other? When are the other countless missing people you don't know mm. getting the same amount of money spent on a search for them? Yeah. But think of all the well-researched podcasts we've had out of it. <laughs> If, yeah, true. If, Actually, that good point down there, Ben Ben Needham. God, I remember that name from when I was at college. That's what's up. Ben Needham was nineteen ninety, mm. still missing today. So that's yeah, what but, thirty, yeah, thirty odd years years ago. Yeah, but Mike, there's all these great ex detectives who've had these great track records of 
really having a goal the night, aren't you, Adam? Bloody hell. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> can't we draft them into some of it? They could do well, and they could even because, have a because, show about it. Because don't forget, they're, they're made of magic, because they solved all these serial killer cases by themselves. Mm. There wasn't a single police officer who actually did any work. They did it themselves, so there we go. 100% I agree. Out. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> They brought some of the biggest monsters in Britain to justice, haven't they? Well, yeah, exactly. Not. Enjoy crime, the death. Ali. It's going to be a great show. Fuck, Ali. We're not going to Glasgow anymore, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you, you take that Ben Needham case. That, that, yeah. That's the perfect example of, like, 33 years ago. Is it now unsolvable? In fact, Madeleine McCann is essentially unsolvable as well. We all, I think we would probably agree, without... Without the, the you know, what's the I can't remember what's his name Christian, the the German suspect. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless he turns around and goes, yeah, okay, I did it. That's the only way this is going to get solved because nobody else is ever going to come forward, is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So the the digging of the reservoirs and the popping the holes in the ground here and there. Do you know what? Yes, it should be done. I, I, and and I was joking when I was you know, obviously. Thank God they've got that money. But actually, yes, these things should be done because. It shouldn't be closed until they go. Actually, it's closed, mm -hmm. um, and 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 every snowstone should be left unturned. Whatever you want to say about it, but there has to be that point where you go. Sorry, like there are other. You know, we are more likely to solve uh, knife crime in Wrexham. For, you know that money spent oh. better there. Oh. I yeah, hear it's a shithole. It's all those <laughs> folks wearing Wu Tang t shirts. Doing other things. <laughs> it's a hum it happens <laughs> daily. By the time you pull up in traffic, uh, traffic lights in Wrexham and they're on red, by the time they've gone green, you've been asked to join two gangs. <laughs> <laughs> Says the man in a Wu Tang shirt. Like, I mean, come on. <laughs> That's a new video, the, don't you? It's all about Reality Thug Life. TV. It's all about Thug Life. Um, oh, no, it's a really interesting one. And, but yeah, I think. You always keep looking until the point where you, you can't look, but then that's that's a very floaty answer. Okay, so, yeah, so Bob, let me ask you this. So should should the police open their files to the amateur sleuths? There's some amazing, there's some dreadful ones with double-barreled surnames, for example, but there's some oh, really uh, good amateur sleuths out there oh, as well. Why not? You haven't solved, managed to solve a crime for 30 years. Open your files. Oh. Let... People do well, it. I suppose the the don't fuck with cats is like the perfect example of that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's the internet solved that. Yeah. And one of my favorite ever stories was Ali going, oh, I've just had a lovely chat with this woman. Apparently she's quite famous. It was the woman from Don't Fuck With Cats that he was talking oh. to. Um but she's that's lovely. the perfect yeah, she was lovely actually. Yeah. Great trousers. Mm -hmm. Um but that's that perfect example of Amazon Sluice's solving, and that's the sensational one. It's the one we all know about because of Netflix. Yeah. But I suppose the danger with that is there is no training. We go back to you talking about the jurors and things like that. There's <clears> none of those people have training. You know, we're uh, uh, the training that we all have for podcasting is by doing it. Um, with ex with the exception of you know maybe having watched a couple of YouTube videos about how to press record on a laptop or whatever it happens to be. Um, having recorded in person with Adam, I know that's you know, anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it's a really dangerous one. Like, yeah. to give it up to an amateur is really, it could go so wrong, yeah. but it could, well, but then again, it could go right. You don't also, want to open completely to every TikToker and every social media influencer out there. No, fuck no. I've, I've been on TikTok, it's weird, man. I, I've, I've thought for ages that it should do it, it but it, it has to be regulated, of course. You can't give it to fucking true crime potting shed or anything to great do show. Yeah. great show great show it's up there being favorites but you can't give it to something like that what you need to do is look at a show take for example plucking out of the air they walk among us right it's a stand it's a standard show isn't it it's up there with your true crime here if ben and rosie decided that they wanted to look into cold cases like that i believe that a, like a vetting agency should look at them and say right okay They've been doing this for X amount of years. They've got that amount of episodes. The quality is fantastic due to the reviews. Yeah, let's talk to them, give them a try, ease evidence to them, knowing that they won't abuse it. You know, you should do something like that. Just what I think. It's 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 an interesting thing when when you do get access to like 
court records and police files and stuff like that when you open it up it's kind of there's a lot of information in there because it's 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 never been planned that someone who's a podcaster or a youtuber or what or a tv series is going to open up these files and suddenly the amount of information that's in there you can understand why a lot of these files or a lot of this information is held for three generations sometimes because not only do you have the immediate families of the victims and the perpetrators, but you've got the next of kin, then you've got the next of kin after that. So I th I, there's definitely a kind of a a layer of, of, of which, if people are going to go that far, they do need to be trained. And to, you're absolutely right. It shouldn't just be open to anyone. Because, because you know, we, we're good and decent people. I mean, some of us are, not all of us. Uh, <laughs> but and, and, you know, we, we, we like to approach things in a very sensitive way. But there is a lot of people who just won't give a shit and they will oh. just go for the sensational and they'll just be like, oh, that's the house where the killer lived. I have to let everyone know where he lived, what his home number was, yeah. what his trouser yeah. size was, what ill disabilities he had. It should be it should be tied up with some sort of disclaimer that you thoroughly have to sign saying like you cannot uh, this that and the other even uh, like watermark crime scene pictures or something so you can't repost them on Instagram or something like that yeah. it, they would soon know who was serious about wanting to help yeah they would I mean and you come back to thing. what you said earlier Mike about um, my my day job outside of podcasting. You know, I've, set up, I've set up my camera. For those that don't know, I work as a, 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 jam, a cameraman for um, a rather large media organisation. Um, and we've had to move wheelie bins out of the background of shop because it's had painted house numbers on it. You know, mm -hmm. identifiable things. And those sort of processes go on in my mind all the time because I'm like, well, I can't. That's the best shot I have, but the house number's on that. So you can't, even though you're talking about people who probably know, well, you can find it on fucking Google Go Maps or whatever it, you want anyway. But there has to be that level of integrity that goes with it. And actually, integrity and, and, and impartiality are the two words that I always think have to inter, intertwine when you're talking about. Because what we do as podcasters is journalism, whether we like it or not. Um, you know, foils up, To me, it falls under that category. We're re researching and telling a story and, 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 and revisiting. It's, it's, it's pretty essentially journalism, really, isn't it? If you can't do integrity and impartiality alongside that, yeah, you don't make the new course to be a amateur sleuth with a vet or whatever it happens to be you know um does, does that take us back to where we were last week in the conversation where where we were talking about um true crime and the difference between as you say journalism and entertainment where where's the border where's the boundary where do we sit sadly it's very blurred it is i agree with you entirely bob i i i consume true crime for entertainment and i'm very aware when i'm consuming it it's the worst day of someone's life. What, what do you think, Ali? I agree. I'm very aware um, of even of the historic tales that Bob and I tell. One of the reasons we don't cover, we say, crimes within living memory um, is that we don't want to upset anybody ever. Um, and, even, and litigation. And litigation, is true. <laughs> but even, <laughs> even in some of the stories that we tell from um, history, um, we're... And I think we've become more and more, as we've progressed as podcasters, and we've become more and more victim aware, yeah. um, even in the way we tell our stories. Um, we'll try wherever we can use the surnames of perpetrators and the first names of victims because it humanizes the victim. Um, and Quite often cases, I just use an adjective. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, very recently, I'm, we haven't released it yet, but I covered the teacup poisoner and I wrote three episodes on it without mentioning his name, apart from once at the very, very, very end. He's got a lot of time on his hands these days. <laughs> I do. <laughs> exactly. really, but it's really interesting because, Paul, you mentioned this last time. We were talking about people using the word ripper, weren't we? That we just don't like at all. No, no, not at all. It's any kind of sensational word. Ripper. It's a sensationalist word. Know. Something like that, you know, it's, yeah, you, you don't need to, I, I understand it sells papers, but it, and it does draw people's attention. How many, to, and actually going back to what you said about entertainment and journalism, how often do you see memes that have pictures of someone lying awake and it says, me trying to sleep, listening to a sleep podcast, 
and underneath, sleeping peacefully, me listening to true crime. Yeah. They're, they're common, aren't they? You know, it's, it's what people do. It's, I'm sure we've all been told that people go to sleep listening to us. It's because that's when people have got time on their hands, isn't it? To mm. sit down sometimes and listen to something yeah. like that. And, yeah. And, and actually, I think you, you touched on it slightly there, Paul, but like, if you want to talk about journalism and entertainment, it, it didn't start with podcasting. There are uh, newspapers out there that rhyme with the the bun or, uh, you know, similar red red headlines, shall we say, red red fronted newspapers. You know, that is journalistic entertainment. That's not that's not journalism. It's, well, you know, I. I think, Bob, to say the sun isn't journalism is absolutely right. So I think we should maybe draw a line under it. Right I've told there. you, litigation's not for us, Adam. You crack on, mate. <laughs> yeah. We've got we got 15 minutes left, okay, guys? So a few questions. Is had is Adam's hair real? Um, yeah, I've got a number of spare scalps I can wear. It's good for the life. <laughs> He's moving how to Turkey next. Rat, that's it. Yeah, how much <laughs> plus VAT is a poo crime award? I, I don't know what this person's talking about. Who would pay hundreds of pounds just to be nominated for award that that can't exist right it must be somebody taking the mickey right that's bonkers if you could offer us a golden jobby award happen? i'm paying for it <laughs> <laughs> and the third question we got here what podcasts are you listening to um bob what do you listen to so i actually don't listen to a lot of true crime i, I the, the one that i would say the most i listen to true crime wise is um I love last podcast on the left and I always have done. I think they are excellent. I think Marcus Parks is a wonderful, wonderful podcaster. No matter what you think about what's happened with Ben recently is, is, is beside the point. Um, but it's my go-to for true crime, actually. Um, used to listen to a lot of true crime garage and things like that. But currently, I, and I've said this, Ali and I have talked about this a few times. I actually just like the sound of a human voice telling a story. I don't listen to much music. So I listen to things like... Um, just binged the entire Young Again series by Kirsty Young, where she's interviewing people because I think she's just an incredible podcaster. Mm -hmm. um, I listen to This Is Love with the yeah, Phoebe Judge that does This Is mm -hmm. Criminal. Uh, her This Is Love series is one, and it's, and it's weird when you're just, you know, I'm walking up to the pub or something and I suddenly realize I'm crying about somebody else's life that I've never fucking met before. Yeah. You know, yeah. so my, my, I'm going through the menopause or something. I don't know. Um, I, you know, I tend to listen to story like people's lives people's stories rather than i get enough of true crime bloody re researching it for the podcast yeah. to, to, to so i'm always the worst person when, when somebody says oh what true crime should i listen to i'm that uh the true crime enthusiast murder mile in uk true crime <laughs> they're what, all what, great <laughs> what about the rest of us any recommendations to our audience that they should be listening to except for ours uh, like bob i listen to very few but um men's ria is Sinead's it's wonderful. Sinead is yeah. fabulous. I only she would make my movie. amateur sleuths Never list, by the way. She would definitely make my list alongside Ben and Rosie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about you, Mike? Do you listen so much? He's gone. Mike's frozen. <laughs> oh, how about you? Thinking about it. Well, no, like, like uh, sort of jumping on the bandwagon there. It sounds like, but it's not. I listen to very little true crime myself, as Bob rightly said before. I get enough of it through write, researching, writing, producing my own show. So sometimes I like to switch off and embracing the massive nerd in me, which I found absolutely fantastic. I listen to an internet, most of that's when I got to sleep. I listen to an internet radio site that plays 24 7 old 1940s Sherlock Holmes episodes. Yeah, oh, sick. With, with <laughs> Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and oh, the out of this world. Send me a link, Paul. <laughs> will do, mate. Will do. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Really. Oh, well, that does do, it. Do, 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 do you know what I do listen to true crime? I mean, we were all at CrimeCon um, when Nicola Talent was there for Crime World, and I knew nothing about um, Dublin gangsters and drug pushers and all the rest of it. But I listened to her relentlessly. I think, it, I mean, she was great, wasn't she? Mm, yeah, yeah. Great, great, yeah. Yeah. And her podcast, I think, is amazing. Mm. <laughs> The other one I listen to is uh, that I listened to because of um, uh, somebody I met at CrimeCon was was the Troubles. Ah, um, Oshin, yeah, yeah, yeah Oshin. Yeah. Uh, just that's what a what a voice that man has. My goodness, um, but just wonderfully told. And but I only listen deliberately listen to that because it's not something I knew a huge amount about. 
um, and would happily point somebody in his direction if, if, if they were looking for something mm. on on Irish history. It's just these. He has a niche there, doesn't he? He really does. Absolutely, and it's something that I, we certainly wouldn't touch. No, um, a, as a topic, you know that we have a very unwritten list of of topics we'll never touch because we either can't or shouldn't, you know, depending on what how you look at it. Um, and that's definitely on there. But he's done it justice and has the ability to do so because he is Irish and he lived there. And you know, mm. you know that, that, that's that's fine. Yeah, I, th I think that's that great. is something you can't really cover unless you have a direct connection to it. Agreed. No, I agree with you. There's a mm. few of them actually. You know, you, you you name the big. Yeah, we could probably all quite happily name massive events that have happened in British history, and never never mind in the last twenty years or whatever that we would all go. Not for us, thank you very much. Nothing to offer, nothing to add. Um, yeah. It's really, it's a really brave. I think him doing the troubles is a really brave decision, and I I, I, I doff my cap to him for doing it. But he's done it very well. Now, I 100% agree. I mean, I've covered a few and I just get so much abuse. So I've not done it for a long time. Look, we've got 10 minutes to go. There's one thing I would like to ask your opinions on. So Chris Caber, the Met Police guy who's been named, the, the person who murdered, sorry, the Met Police officer accused of murder over a fatal shooting of Chris Caber has been named. What do you think about this? Should he be named? Ali, what do you think? I, I think he probably should have been named, yeah. Um, I think we need more transparency now more than ever um, in what the police do and in how they conduct themselves. And I think if they're going to gain back a lot of the trust that they've lost over the past decade because of a variety of incidents, that they need to be more transparent than the general public. And if it was a member of the public, they would have been named. He's a murderer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, and that boils down to it. And exactly what Ali says. The trust in, human, in the, the British policing and, and the Met right through to Police Scotland is, de is, is, is in the gutters. It really is. Because of um, <clears throat> horrible things that have been incredibly well covered and, 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 and outed in the press. The police know this. Like the police themselves know this. I, I was on a course at the Metropolitan Police um, College this week about public order. They know that as frontline facing officers, they're in the shit at the moment. But the only way to get out of that is by doing things like, here's the badge in, by the way. Here he is. Like we, This is not all of us. I remember uh, co uh, conducting an interview with um, uh, Sir Ian Sterling that used to be the head of Police Scotland at Tully Allen, which is the, the police college here in Scotland. And he, he was making a ridiculous statement that said, Police Scotland is institutionally racist, but my officers aren't. And I went, fuck off, mate. Institutional racism has to come from somewhere. You can't just say the bricks and mortar around me is racist. It is your officers that are, that are creating that issue. Mm. Now, the problem with that is if they don't out them like they have done with with them, um, Martin something, wasn't it? I can't remember the guy's name. Um, if they don't out them and distance themselves from that, it will never change. Even though it's changing internally, it needs to change in human perception because if we are being policed by consent, which is the way police are, policing happens in this country and always has done, you have to, you have, to have trust and... Um, I don't know the words I'm looking for. You have to, you have to really believe in what they're doing to have policing by consent as a as a, a general rule ah, i agree paul what do you think oh i wonder do you think this decision to name this officer comes because like ali said they need to be more transparent than ever right now and it so happens to have come the same week that this inquiry about wayne cousins and why he was a serving police officer when he was accused of rape before he even applied to be an officer many years ago. Do you think that's the Met trying to say, look, okay, yeah, we can't afford to cover anything like this up again. We are in the shit. This is the start of them coming back and being honest and making the changes that need to be. Or is it just to kind of deflect more flack off them? I wonder if it really is the start of something better. I don't know. Not convinced. 
I hope so. Me too. I hope so, but I'm not convinced. It's that tricky moment, though, isn't it? Is whether we agree with them doing it or not is beside the point. The purpose of doing it, I would presume, is to do exactly what you say, is to distance themselves from these individuals rather than saying the police force. And it's, no, it's not the police force, it's him, him specifically. And that makes a massive difference. If they can individually weed them out, then that makes the, the, the institution itself much cleaner and better by, by going, it's not... The, it's not out, you know, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the people who become police officers do it for the right reason, mm -hmm. and that's, that's that, that goes without saying. And we and you know we all believe that, but the, it takes one to fuck it all up, doesn't it? And by them going, here's the one that's trying to fuck it all up in our news reports and on our statements. Please don't judge the rest of my officers, depending on who it is, whatever force. You know, please don't judge everybody here. They are trying to do and make this country i mean we're bloody lucky to live in this country and have a very good police force that means we don't have to worry about going outside other than the red lights in wrexham obviously um obviously it's but that has to come alongside them being transparent transparency i think is what it boils down to mm -hmm. isn't it yeah as ali said before if, if anyone else apart from a police officer would be named and he's still a human being at the end of the day more so, he should be named. Yeah, I completely agree. Oh, but Mike, welcome back, by the way. It's nice to have you back again. <laughs> um, You've had a fucking night I can, I can... tonight. <laughs> I can almost hear you. I I, I get it. It's, this is I know this is going to be an old reference, but this is like having a conversation with Norman Collier. <laughs> back in the seventies, as per usual. Hey. Yeah, he did that routine for how many bloody years? <laughs> What, what, what's your view on this then? What's your view on the Met Officer? Yeah, it's 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 a hard one. Isn't it? There's always going to be. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. There's always going to be rotten apples in the barrel. They're always going to be there. Um, is it worth naming him? I don't know. It's that's kind of a tough one, isn't it? I don't know. I'm 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 still unsure. But but to to kind of penalise as. Bob says to kind of penalise the whole force based on a few bad people. I think it's kind of wrong, especially if you look at every other industry. There's going to be assholes everywhere. There's going to be people who take the piss. If you look at like CEOs of major companies, how many of them are absolute shitbags who are getting away with stuff every single day? And the reason we don't know about that is because they've got the money to protect themselves. Whereas yeah. a a bog standard copper. They're just going to be thrown under the bus, which is not to say they don't deserve to be thrown under the bus, but is to say the reason that we're getting angry and upset and rightfully upset about it is because we know should they're going they to be, be protected. Held in, should they not be held, be held in higher regard, though? Should they not be held in yeah, higher as, regard because of what they do? As a public servant, yeah, absolutely. As, especially as, you know, as a taxpayer, we are funding them, so yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think people generally do accept that you know 99% of the police are good people doing it for the yeah. right reasons and it is a couple of bad apples spoiling it for everyone but i think a lot of the public have lost confidence in mm -hmm. the police prosecute within their own industry um and i think because of that they have to um step up their game and almost be more zealous and more transparent and more open um, with their internal affairs, uh, I, I, I mean, I think it's an impossible job. If I was advising it, any of my children, I'd be saying, "Do not join the police. You can't win." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a real shame, isn't it? Because, as we know from CrimeCon, there are some great ex-police people about who did amazing jobs. You're doing wonderful this evening, Adam. and there are some great <laughs> serving on right now out there who are doing it for the right reasons. <laughs> So we're almost finished. So uh, we've got a want, couple of minutes left. Go on, Bob, two, two pub quiz questions Go on. That, that I've started writing for the weekend here. Um, the Metropolitan Police Force is the largest in the UK. Do you know what the second largest police force in the UK is? Ooh. Police Scotland? West Mersia. I mean, it's one of the Yorkshire ones. Alistair got it correct. There are 32,000 serving police officers in the Met. There's 16,500 in Police Scotland. 
used to be Greater Manchester was the biggest, but since they merged all the okay. uh, forces in Scotland. So that was a fiddle you told Ali before we started. Okay, no, we'll yeah. You think, I, you think I want him to win? You having a fucking laugh? Is, um, is the second question, Bob? How many of the Met? How many of those in the Met are wrong ones? Oh yeah, it's ninety nine percent. The other one, which I would uh, assume Adam will get, is what is who received the longest prison sentence from a Scottish court? Think of the best crime book you've ever read, guys. I was going to let you plug it. Oh, <laughs> I mean, they're all shit. <laughs> I believe he went fishing. Is that, is that yeah? <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. In a van. It was Angus Sinclair got 37 years. And I was actually genuinely surprised when Packer didn't get more. But um, it was, uh, yeah, the two of them were up there. There you go. I just started writing a, a, two, a very short true crime round for next week's pub quiz. So there, there's the two that I've done so far. And is that this at the settle in, Bob? Is that where you run the quiz? Yeah, once a month I do it. Um, so Ali and I record in the settle in. It's the oldest pub in Stirling. It was opened in the 1730, 1733, sorry. So we're having its 300th birthday in a, in a couple of years' time. And we're actually, we're, we, we joke about the place, but we, we adore it. We're very on, it. honored to, that they let us. They never organize anything on a Tuesday night so that Ali and I can sit up the back and have the old cunts down the bottom. Sorry, am I allowed to say that on here? Um, <laughs> They're all playing dominoes while Ali and I are recording a, a podcast. And we make no bones about it. It's a pub. We record in a pub. If you don't like background music, jog on. There's loads of podcasts. Um, but it's a it's a it's a place that's close to my heart. Adam, you've been in. You, yeah. you know, you know how cool a pub it is. And I, right, I yeah. host host the pub quiz once a month. And uh, I'm actually going to the pub quiz straight after this, but I am um, I'm not hosting this evening, I'm partaking. Wonderful. So guys, we're over over an hour and it's felt like minutes, hasn't it? It's been so much fun. I'm sure the audience agree with us, yeah? I mean, the amount of folk that dropped off and on this call is just mad. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, any, any final comments at the end of this evening? Um, uh, thanks a million for having us. Um, and although I um, talked to begin with about the sensationalist content and the worrying lack of research, um, that I think is a trend. There is also some fantastic stuff um, being done. Uh, and I think that some of them do deserve a little mention. And the Channel 4 documentary on um, the killing of Awiza, uh Anwar by her husband on Arthur's seat mm -hmm. um, is amazing. The entire um, trial is recorded and it is a fascinating watch i had the pleasure oh, of interviewing i had a pleasure of interviewing family measures members of that on that case and it, yeah it's it's wild yeah um bob anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we leave this evening uh, i'd like just like to leave you with a thank you love you bye as always it's on brand very, very good paul <laughs> anything from you yeah, it's nice to say happy Mum's Day to all those mums out there. And if your mum's not with us, then spare us, we're all saving spare thoughts for you. And if you're a single dad, I hope you got flowers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mike, any, anything to add? Uh, th this is this has been the only moment in the last 10 minutes that I've actually been able to hear. So <laughs> and it's the end. this is the end. <laughs> That's not a bad thing, so Mike. It, it, I, I, I've enjoyed the ending. Thank you very much. Is, is, is that your usual line? <laughs> is that what you were saying yeah. in the last 10 minutes, Mike, when you were in on camera? I'm done, and now I'm out. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much, everybody, for taking the time to join us this evening. This has been Bob, Ali, Paul, Mike, and me, Adam. It's been great fun. See you next time. Cheerio for now. Hey, guys. See you all. Woo!